Um, everybody, if you read your Bible, you know you've read, you've gone through this time. This is a period of history. Talking about Ahab and Jezebel and all of that. What a wicked king. A terrible, terrible wicked king. Um, you know, this. Uh, the previous chapter, chapter 19, mentions uh, uh, Elisha. And he is going to follow. He's going to follow Elijah. Amen. And uh, he's going to be trained. And it's interesting that in the next chapter, after God calls Elisha, that uh, there's no mention of, of here. But we read about the first Syrian campaign. The first time the Syrians here in this, in this book, in the chapter, where they're attacking Israel. And uh, so when they, when they decided to do that, and of course you read, we, Brother Hazen read, King Ben-Hadad and all that. Um, when, they, when they did this, they thought, wait a minute. You know, this battle was on a mountaintop. This was on the mountaintop. I wonder, you know, they believed in this thing where they had different gods for different situations and different gods in different localities in the nation of Israel. And they thought, you know what, the way their God is, you know, maybe he's just the special God for the victories on the mountaintop. And uh, so anyway, and you know what, even during this time, when you study the, the, the history of the nation of Israel, um, you know, as I've already mentioned, King Ahab, he, he wasn't a good king. He was not. And, um, but there was something at stake here, more than a king, and it was God's honor. Because people will mock God. And if you read the book of Judges, you'll find there were times that the kings were just, the judges were terrible. I mean, some of them were, they were good, and then things got off and everything. But God would just do it for the sake of his honor. Um, as a matter of fact, in that one verse there, let me go back and read this. So here's what the, the on, so the first campaign, they, they lost. They thought, I know, we, we, we fight them in that valley, in the place of the plain there. Oh, I know their God is probably just the God of the mountains, okay? But not the one of the valley, so let's go for it. And they got all ramped up and everything. That's what he said in verse 23, the servants of the king, Syria, said, their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we, but let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. Oh, they don't know our God, that's for sure. They do not know him at all, amen. And so what the Bible says here, over skip down to verse 28, so then there came a man of God. You know, we read about this man of God in different times in this book. He's an unnamed prophet. Amen. He's an unnamed prophet. We don't know who it was. Some may have some ideas of who it was. But here this unnamed prophet, okay? And uh, he said this. Read that again. And this is, where, this is my text for this morning. And he spake unto the king of Israel, speaking of Ahab, and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, it's because they said something. And again, God's honor was at stake. Amen. And it's not, it's not about Ahab. <laughs> it's about God. That's what it is. It's all about the Lord. Amen. And he said this, that uh, the Lord is God of the hills. That's what the Syrians were saying. Oh, he's just God of the hills. But he's not the God of the valleys. Oh, therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. You know what God's greatest desire is that people will know who he is. We talked about that last week. He's worthy. Amen. We talked about the who last week. And if you understand who he is, you shouldn't have any reservation as far as living for him and serving him. Amen. Whatever he would require of you or ask of you, there should never be any hesitation if you know who he is. Amen. And you know, God's desire even back in David's day was the fact that he says, he said, I want that the, all the earth may know who the Lord is. That's what David said when he conquered the giant. That, listen, that's an important thing. Amen. You know what? You say, why did God give David that victory? Because that was his desire. His desire was not just to slaughter the giant, but that the world would know who his God was. Amen. And he is today. And so this is the same thing that the man of God is saying. He's saying that, 
Now, I want to kind of liken this, you know, this mountaintop to maybe you're on a spiritual high, okay? And in the valley, maybe you're not so high spiritually. Maybe you're kind of dis discouraged and depressed and all that kind of stuff. But you know that same God that gave you the victory on the mountaintop is also the one that wants to help you in the valley, he wants to take care of you. He wants to uh, give you that victory, amen? And so when we think about that, I want you to uh, just dwell on that thought. You know, when we go through the valley experience, he is God. When we go through the valley of physical pain, he is still God. When we enter the valley of discouragement, he is still God. When we enter the valley of sorrow, he is still God. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same, amen? You can trust him. You can go to him anytime. Listen, you come to me, and I'm, I'm up and down like everyone else. Amen? We all have our good days and our bad days. We have a, a day that maybe we're thinking, I'm feeling pretty good right now, and then maybe there's a day I'm a bit off. Amen? We all have that. But you can go to God, and he's not that way. You can count on him. He never changes. That's the immutability of God. Amen? That's a, listen, that's, that's God. That's who he is. Amen? I'm so glad he's that way. Oh, I'll tell you something. God is so good. God is so good. And you know what? God is trying to still work on Ahab, even though he's as wicked as anybody. Amen. And you know what? To get him to acknowledge the Lord. Maybe sometimes that's what God's trying to do. We talked about a little bit of trial and, and testings at the 10 a.m. Sunday school hour. And you know, he says, the trying of your faith worketh patience. Mm, yeah. God's trying to test your faith. Amen. Where's your faith? I'm strong. I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Amen. That's good. You know, the same faith you had for your soul's salvation, God says you can have that same kind of faith to trust God on the day-to-day -day problems of life. You can get through these things. Amen. And if there's one group of people on planet Earth that ought to be able to stand up and say, hey, to God be the glory because God's helped me through this problem. And, and they ought to be able to see that and hear that testimony from your own mouth because God got you through this. You shouldn't say, you know, I was so smart, man. I did this and I did this. I did all these things. And no, you could just say one thing, to God be the glory. God got me through this. They might say, who's this God? He's the same God on the mountaintop as he is in the valley, amen? He'll help you in any situation, whatever you're at, and in between, amen, wherever you're at. See, the God of the mountains or the hilltops, amen, that represents the high points of our lives. It's the times where we feel like we're right on the top of things. It's the moments of excitement and successes in life. Hey, the mountain is a place of accomplishments. During the times of mountaintops, it's easy to praise God. It's easy to praise God. It really is. And then he's, uh, it's also God revealed. You ever read about in the Old Testament with Abraham? He revealed, God revealed himself to Abraham on Mount Moriah. Remember when he sacrificed, he was going to put his son there. God's testing his love and all of that. And God, the Lord says, stop, stop. Amen. Now I know you love me. Amen. God spoke to Elijah on us in, us in this book here in the still small voice on, on, on Mount Horeb. Amen. Jesus Christ went to some of the greatest temptations on a mountaintop. It's what he did, amen? He said, the devil said, cast yourself down. The angels will help you up, amen? That's what the devil said to him. The most, one of the greatest moments in Christ's earthly ministry was the moment at the Mount of Transfiguration where he gave a pre, pre, uh, pre, uh, preview of his, of his uh, glorified body and the brightness, amen? And they were on a mountaintop when they saw that. Oh, the psalmist this week, I gave a, a, a message at the, at the mission, and I talked about Psalm 121. I usually use this for funerals, and little did I realize I would be asked to do one right after I preached it. Amen. He said, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. You got to look up. We got to keep on looking up. Amen. We're looking too much this way in life. We're always looking horizontal. You got to look up, look up, look up, looking unto him, the author and finisher of our faith, looking for that blessed hope. Look up, keep on looking up, look up. Amen. Praise God. You know, mountain experiences, amen. They can, they can empower us. They can encourage us. Praise God for that. But you know what? You can't stay on the mountaintop. That's not real life. Life is ups and downs in life. It's up and down. Amen. That's just life because we're living in a sin-cursed world. It's been fractured by sin 6,000 years ago in the garden there. 
Amen. Oh, our mountaintop experiences, do you know what they're for? They're also to help you prepare yourself for the valleys. For the valleys. You're going to go through a valley. I'm not trying to scare you, but you're going to face it sometime or another. How are you going to do with it? You better stay strong in the Lord. You know what some of us are like? Oh, I, yeah. oh I'm going through this oh, hard time, Pastor. I really need to pray. Weren't you praying before? Right. Oh, Pastor, I really need to read the Bible now. You know, well, what happened? Oh, I'm going through something. What happened before that? Why are we waiting for the problems to come our way? And then say, oh, we really need God now. You, don't, you need him every day. You need him when you're on the mountaintop. You just don't need him in the valley. People think that and think, well, everything's going my way. You better stay close to God regardless of where you're at. The God of the valleys. Oh, you know what I like? I looked this up. In the Bible, 456 times the Bible says this, and it came to pass. That means it's not going to stay. Whatever you're going through, it will not stay. It will pass someday. 456 times in your Bible it says, and it came to pass. It will change. You say, well, I don't know if it's going to change before Jesus comes back. I don't know either, but it will pass when he takes you there. It won't be anymore, amen. We'll be transformed and changed. Praise God, amen. Oh, I'm telling you. You know, God's just not a God of the mountains. He's also the God of the valleys. Whatever it is you're going through, amen. God says, hey, I want to help you. I want to help you. I want to encourage you. I want to strengthen you, amen. That's what he wants to do for you. And the Bible says this, the watch says, and he says this, that God, listen, you know, whenever you look at a, a picture, I, I love taking pictures and doing some photography. I haven't had done a lot lately. Last time I took a picture, I took my grandson. The ladies were up to something, and I said, oh, I'll take my grandson. We'll go, and, and we, we, we did. We went to Uniac, and then we ended up going to this place. I said, I looked on my trails map. I said, I'd like to check this falls out. Best time to see falls is in the spring. Amen. And boy, those falls were running. McKenna's Fall, McKenna's Brook Falls. Man, I'll tell you, what a beauty. Took a little bit to get down into the gorge. It was like that, and I'm hanging onto roots and hanging onto a tree, and he's coming down with me, amen. But we were down there. I didn't want to leave, but I had to go back. And I'm standing there. I'm looking at those falls, and I'm right down by the creek there, and the falls are just coming down. I said, man, I'll tell you, what a beauty. What a beauty, amen. Praise God. But you know what? Uh, have you ever noticed something about the valleys? Listen, I lived in Denver, Colorado as a kid, and, and I, I, in, in uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, I, when I lived in Denver, Colorado, and Denver, Colorado has more peaks, and I'm sorry, I don't know the meters. I know a lot of you have been trained in the meters things, and I, I can understand those. That's not that, but I'm used to the feet, 14,000 feet. There's more peaks over 14,000 feet in the state of Colorado than any other place in North America. Oh, I'm telling you, it's amazing, beautiful. And I remember this time, Dad, he, we would go on these trips, go into the mounds, we'd go skiing, we went golfing. That's My dad trained us on all that stuff. And we went into, we, we're going to go to Mount Evans. If you look it up, I, I, it's still there, and they kind of, the, the uh, national parks of the United States, they kind of limit how many people go up because the road is very narrow. And back when we went up there on Mount Evans, there's no railings as you're going up this mountain 14,000 feet. <laughs> you know, as a kid, you got so much trust and faith, amen? <laughs> now that you're older, you look, ah, I don't know if I'd go up there. And uh, so anyway, we're going up the top. And you know, if you know anything about the Rockies, you've lived there, moved, you know, check things out across Canada, you know there's something called the timber line. Amen? That's where the, the, the things kind of change, really. And, and when you get above the timber line, the air's so thin, the trees kind of like, they look all kind of weird and scrunched up and twisted up. <laughs> and when you get to the top, at some level, there's really nothing but maybe some grass or something, maybe, or some, you know, other things growing, but there's no trees. There's no trees growing at all. And usually at Mount Evans, it's just a pile of rock. But boy, you can see. See, Denver, Colorado is a mile high. It's called the Mile High City. When you step on the Capitol State Building, one of those steps, it says you are now 5,280 feet above sea level. You'd never know it because you come all the way from Chicago and you're coming through the plains and you get to Colorado. It's you're on a gradual incline. And next thing you know it, you're a mile high already. And we were there, but you know what? You know where the grass is greenest? You know where the, it's luscious, it's growing, things are growing strong and healthy? 
It's the place you don't want to be and I don't want to be. In the valley. It's in the valley. God wants to help you grow and get closer to him. Are you going to let him do that? See, we want God. God, get me out. God, get me out of this. I don't want it anymore. God does never promise you want to get you out, but he promised to get you through it. There's times where you just got to learn and trust God. And God will get you through that. Are you, well, are you willing and ready to trust God? Or you just, you just want God to get you out? You know, one of the things the devil does in, when this thing about the valley, someone wrote this, and I, I, it's not mine, but they wrote this, and it's, I don't even know what the title is, and I don't know who it's from. But anyway, it was advertised that the devil was going to put his tools up for sale. And on the date of the sale, the tools were placed for public inspection, each being marked with a sale price. There were, tre there was, uh, there were a treacherous lot of implements. What were they? Hatred. Those are his implements. Envy. Jealousy. Doubt. Lying. Pride. And so on. Laid apart from the rest of the pile was a harmless looking tool. Well worn and priced very high. What is the name of the tool? Asked one of the purchasers. Oh, said the adversary, that's discouragement. Why have you priced it so high? Because it's more useful to me than any other tool. I can pry open and get inside a person's heart with that one when I cannot get near them with the other tools. Now, once I get inside, I can make them do what I choose. It's a badly worn tool because I use it on almost, almost everyone since few people know it belongs to me. How about that? See, the devil's price for discouragement was so high, he never sold it. It's still his major tool, and he uses it in the people of God today. If you've been with us for a while, you know I've gone through this list. I won't labor this list, but I want to share some of these tools to you. He's got more tools, and this is called the deadly D. Some of you, you've asked for the, the outline of this, and I've shared it. If you did not get it last time, come see me or message me, and I'll share it with you. I didn't come up with this list. I did add some. There was originally 16. I think it was Wilmington made up this list, and he probably got it from someone else. There's nothing new under the sun, amen? Anyway, but I added two of them in here. Discouragement was the first. What else is a tool of the devil? Disappointment. Something didn't meet up to your expectations. Amen? Something happens in your life. Disappointments. You know what? Someone said this. Disappointments are when we forget that situations are just appointments, God's appointments. That's the valley experience that maybe God's putting you through. The third thing, despair, to be without hope. You know, I am so glad, I am so glad that the Bible says in Hebrews 6, 19, that my hope in Christ, he's the anchor of my soul, that hope is sure and steadfast. It's sure. Amen. That's the anchor of my soul. We have an anchor. Praise God for that. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Oh, thank God for that. Amen. Oh, what's another one? This one worked in the beginning of mankind. It's called doubt. That was Satan's first tactic, and that's what the devil uses today, too, to cause you to doubt his word, doubt the truth. Hey, the devil said the first question. The Bible says he said this, yea, hath God said. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Yes, he did. But the devil wants you to doubt God and doubt his word, not to trust him. Oh, you can count on God's word. It'll come to pass. Amen. It will. Amen. Amen. Doubt. That's the first tactic. What else? Disbelief which is the final form of doubt, disbelief, amen? Oh, what else? Distractions. Oh, man, we live in a world full of distractions. You know, not all distractions are bad. Hey, guys, there's a distraction that God says is great and is good. You know what that is? If you're married. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 7. That, listen, a someone can be, if, if, you're, um, if you're married, you have a distraction, he says, if you're single, some people have that gift. Some say, well, I thought it was not good for a man to be alone. Read 1 Corinthians 7. There are some who have a gift and stay, keep themselves holy and pure for God. And he said this, that they can attend unto the Lord without distraction. Those are the words he uses there. Hey, listen, if you're married, you can't do that. You have a distraction. It's called your wife or your husband. 
you got to consider them. Hey, listen, you're married, you got to consider them. Amen. You got to take care of her. You got to take care of him. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm serving the Lord. Hey, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You're supposed to listen. You're supposed to, if you're married, number one, number one is your relationship to God. Number two is your relationship with your spouse. Then the kids come in there down below that. Hey, listen, are you attending? Listen, are you are taking care of your good distraction, guys? But you know what the problem is? We got other things that come into our life that God, that can cause us to be distracted in a wrong way. And you hear me say it all the time. I'm not against technology. We got the screen here. I got this thing here. I have a laptop at home. I have a cell phone. But I'll tell you something, guys. That thing don't control me. I control it. If you can't control it, you need help. And you need to come to that point. And you need to look up to God and get help for the sake of your marriage, your home, and your family. Otherwise, you're going to lose them. We got temptations that are coming at us from all different angles. The moment you hit that click, you know how the algorithms work. You're going to get flooded with that. Right. You're going to get flooded with that kind of stuff. You clicked it once, bang, all of a sudden, it says, you like that. And all of a sudden, it starts throwing all this stuff at you. Oh, boy, you better be careful. Distractions. The Bible tells us we live in a world of distractions. Amen. It's all around us. Sometimes you get caught up with your device or your Watching something that you, have you even spent time in the Word? Have you spent time in prayer? Have you spent time with your kids? Right. Amen. Have you spent time, listen, you're with your wife, your husband. Oh, we're so connected. But we haven't been connected to the ones that God wants us to be connected to. Oh, boy, we better be careful. Double-mindedness, there's another tool. It's another D. Amen. That's instability having two masters, you're tossed and turned, who you're going to serve. Hey, Jesus says, you either love the one and hate the other. It's a love-hate relationship according to Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 6, I think it's verse 23, 24, 25, somewhere in there. It's a love-hate relationship. You say, I don't hate them. If you don't love them, you do. That's what he said. You either love or you hate. That's what he said. You hold to the one or you despise the other. Whoa, that's rough. That's pretty rough. You can't stay neutral, amen? You can't stay neutral. Here's another one, number eight, dishonesty. That's not worthy of trust or belief. People are not honest. You know, one of the things I always struggle with is this. When I'm trying to help people in their marriages, and you got the couple there, if they can just both be honest, everybody kind of shades their story a little bit to kind of lift them up higher than their spouse. It's the way it works. It just That's the nature, our human nature. Or we hold back on some things that we're not divulging the whole thing. It's kind of hard to help people if, you don't, if you're not transparent and open. Amen. And I'm telling you, but that happens. People are dishonest. Yeah. There's stuff that happened and that's not being shared. And as a result, how can, how can I help a couple? How can I help a couple in a marriage if they're not being honest with the past, with the pastor, with the counselor? Amen. Deceit, deceive, again, it's pretty much the same thing as the, you know, what we've already talked about. Um, deceit, deceive, deception, dullness, amen? People get dull of hearing. You hear this voice. You say, oh, I heard this message before. I'm going to tune out of the pastor. Hey, listen, 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 I don't know about you, but you ever read First Peter? You ever read the epistles of Peter? He says this, listen, he says, well, he's going to stir up people by the way of remembrance, though you already know these things, and been established in the present truth. He says, even though you know what I'm talking about, and you're established in the truth of God, you know what he says? You need to be stirred up again by way of remembrance. You need these little reminders. Amen. What else? Um, dullness, deadness, lifeless. You know what? God wants us to be full of life. Oh, you say, I'm in my downtime. Okay, but listen, God will help you through that, and he'll get you. He'll pick you back up if you let him. Some people don't want, listen, I've been to people, I've talked to some people, and they say, stay away from me. Leave me alone. I want to help you. I want to lift you up. Don't bother me right now. Hey, listen, I want to help you. I want to lift you up. I want to help you. Would you let me do that? Part of the problem is that people don't want to. They want to stay in that state. They want to stay in the valley. They do. They do. Oh, unfortunately. Um, delay. Oh, that's a good one. 
procrastinate, put it off, put it off. Oh, you need, you know, pastor, I need to do this. I need to do this in my home. Oh, pastor, I need to do this in my relationship with Jesus. Oh, I need to do this. Uh, this is things I need to do. And you, can't, you t talk about it. We talk about it, but what do we do about it? What do we do about it? Amen. Procrastination. Putting off those who are not saved. Amen. Listen, he's going to say, don't get saved. Don't listen to that preacher. Don't do anything about it. That's what he'll say. Procrastination. Amen. That's what it is. Delay. Put it off. Discord. You want to ruin a church? Discord. You want to ruin a marriage? Discord. You want to ruin a company? Discord. That's discord, that's enmity, that's fighting inward. You know what? Most organizations, churches, businesses, governments are destroyed from within. It's not the enemy without. It's the, it's the, it's the discord and all the strife and the bickering and the arguing that goes on within a group or within a home or a family. The devil's out there. He says, I don't need to bother with that family because they're already fighting with each other. That's what's happened. I remember when I went in 2019, when we went and I preached at that church that I, I spent 17 years of my life before I came to Nova Scotia and uh, helped out the pastor in that church. And uh, so anyway, I was talking to the preacher that was there. He wasn't the preacher that was there when I was there years ago. It was a new pastor. And so anyway, he said, said something to me. We're just chatting, you know, iron sharpens iron, just sharing things, talking about things. And he said this, hey, Brother Parent, do you ever think about this? And I said, what, Brother? He says, you know, when David was in that valley there, and he was, uh, he was looking at uh, that giant, amen, you know what? He cast stone. It was just one stone, by the way. He had five. He was ready to take care of the brothers, too, the brothers of Goliath. And uh, he, he was ready. He was ready. Anyway, he says that first stone that he cast, you know what Goliath is in the Bible? A picture of the devil, a picture of the enemy. You know what? We're not your enemy. So don't cast stones at each other. Your husband's not your enemy. Your wife's not your enemy. Come on. David cast a stone at the giant. Amen. Not at the brethren. The brethren were behind him. The children of Israel were behind him. They were shaking in their boots. And, and Saul was taller than any other man, head and shoulders. And he's shaking in his boots. He should have been up there. David stood that giant as a young man. And he threw, got that stone on the first hit. It was knocked that giant down. He was done. I won't, read, I won't tell you what happened on the rest. You know you read the rest. That's how they used to do it in Bible times. I won't say anything. I don't want to get anybody getting sick here. Anyway, that's what they did, the enemy. Anyway, you know what? Uh, discord, discord, defilement. Hey, the Bible says, be separate, saith the Lord. Come apart. I talked about that on Wednesday night. Hey, hey, there's got to be a difference between darkness and light. Can people see the difference in your life versus the world? The world's in darkness. You're a ch child of the light if you're saved today. There ought to be a difference. Amen. Defilement. The Bible says, yeah, listen, you know, there's a such thing. People got this idea, unclean. That's only Old Testament. Read the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Talks about the unclean, even in the New Testament. How about that? Amen. Defame. Here's another D. Criticize. You know, it's sad when people always got critical things. You know, they're all, it, their statements are like, you know, this is good. You know, oh, that's wonderful. And, blah, blah, and all of a sudden, but... And they come out with some negative. I mean, some people, it's habitual. They just constantly, just always got to throw in the last little thing and say, but can you ever say, maybe have a conversation without have any negative statement? I'd like you to check yourself out next time you talk to somebody. Yeah. We all are subject to that, by the way. All of a sudden, a negative thought comes in, and you're talking, talking negative. Like, wow. Oh, the devil loves us. These are all his tools. These are all his tools, amen? It just wasn't discouragement, but all these other. Um, that's defaming. Disobedience. That's noncompliance. When you read 1 Samuel chapter 15, the Bible says that when, when Saul did not completely obey God in the matter of the Amalekites and, uh, and, and King Agag and so forth, the Bible says that, you know, 
Saul said, you know what? I got the sheep here, you know, and Samuel heard the, 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 the bleeding of the sheep. He says, hey, wait a minute. Hey, Saul, did you take care of business like God said? Oh, yeah, I did, and all of a sudden, bah, bah. hey, what's that over there? Oh, you got a sheep left. You weren't supposed to keep that around. What are you doing? You didn't completely obey God. See, we say this. I did one, two, three, four, but I didn't finish up with five. I took care of this, 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 but I didn't do that. You think you're okay? The Bible says in the book of James, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That kind of, that's sins of omission. You know you're supposed to be doing something, you're not doing it. We think it's only sins of commission. I didn't do that, I didn't do that. Let me ask you a question. What are you doing? What are you doing for God? Amen. Disobedience, and he said this, that that disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. It's like rebellion and idolatry. That's what he said. He said, I would never, I would never be involved pastor in witchcraft. God, God says, here's, here's the level. Disobedience, defiance against God's word. Same plane. It's equal to. How about that? Hey, parents, you better train your kids. Dads, the Bible says, fathers, bring them up. Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train them up. Amen. We got a responsibility as parents. Amen. It's, it's one thing to bring them into this world. It's another thing to be consistent at it and teaching them and training them. Man, my heart's so touched when I see Thelma's all her great, 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 great. Okay, sorry. I'm making you feel older, eh? I lost track, though. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Great, 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 great. <laughs> Amen. Did that touch your heart? Touched my heart last week. Touched my heart this week. She, she, she's bringing them to church. She says, come on down. I know some of them were dropped off. I understand. That's a blessing. Amen. What a blessing. Train them. Hey, listen, even as a senior, you got access to those little ones? Do what you can. Come on. Listen, you say, well, my kids or my grandkids or this level of, you know, generations, they've messed up, and maybe you got access to the other ones. Come on. Don't give up. Hey, there's hope. Amen. There's hope. Amen. I am. Praise the Lord. It's just if we can be consistent. Isn't that right? Come on. Can we be consistent? I know you. I'm tired and this. We all go through that. By the way, it doesn't get easier as you get older, eh, Thelma? Hey, Nethering. Amen. She loves, man, I'll tell you, the kids, the kids come from all over for her. She's trying to help them out. Trying to help them all out. I'll tell you, I don't know what kind of rewards these ladies are going to get. I'm reaching out. Come on. Amen. Disobedience. Discontentment. You know what the Bible says in Paul's letter to Philippian church, the church at Philippi, Philippians 4, he says this. And, and he learned to be content in whatsoever state he was in. That's not one of the 50 of the U.S. either. Are you content? You've got to learn. It's a process of learning to be content. Well, I've got to have this. I saw it on the billboard. I don't know, you know. I know they still use billboards. They must be making money. Is that right? They must be. They're still up. You say, oh, yeah, I got to go there. You just saw it. Or it's a subliminal. Register up here, and then all of a sudden, ding. amen. That's, it's subliminal. It's part of this in psychology, behavior modification. It's what it is. Anyway, but you know what? Can you learn to be content with what you got? Listen, if something's broken, of course, fix it. If you can't, you know, replace it. Repair it, whatever, you know? But if you absolutely don't need it, why go out and buy another one? What's the point? Yeah. Why? why? Why would you do that? Yeah. Amen? I got to have this. You better, you better examine those words. Yeah. I have to have this. Do you? God said he promised in Philippians 4.19, the same chapter, that he promised to provide our needs. And his definition of needs may not be the same as yours. You've got to get online with God. That's why Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 is in there, because my ways and my thoughts are not yours, he said. 
So you better line up your thoughts and ways with God before you start expecting God to fulfill that need. That need may not be a true need in God's eyes. Maybe a need in your eyes. Amen. Discontentment. This world breeds discontentment. As I've already mentioned, you, you know, if you click something on the internet, you say, I just wanted to look at that thing on Amazon. Next thing you know, there's, I looked one time for a tripod. Next thing you know, I'm getting tripods coming out of my ears. Man, everywhere, every, the sidebars on there, the, man, the tripod, tripod, tripod. Like, okay, I'm done with the tripod. <laughs> Forget the tripod. That's what happens. You start click, 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 and all of a sudden, this thing's all these advertisements. They know what you're doing. You left some cookie crumbs somewhere. You did. Yeah. Amen. You left them somewhere. They found you. That's how they make money. And what's the last one? D, disloyalty or unfaithfulness. Number one, we ought to be faithful to God. Number two, if you're married to your spouse. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, you ought to be faithful to God, faithful to your spouse, faithful to the Lord, faithful to your church. Amen. Faithful to work. Show up on time. Amen. You want to keep your job? Show up on time. By the way, show up on time for church. Amen. If it's important, you show up on time. We're not going to say, you're not welcome here because you came late. It's not a job. Show up on time. Amen. I'm not trying to pick on any one individual here. I'm just saying. You know, in the workplace, I think it's still that way. It was that way when I was growing up in my younger years. If you didn't, if you listen, you just got a job and you kept on coming in late, you'd lose that job. Say, see you later. Especially if you're under probation. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You want that job? But I understand. I know my daughter. I won't say the company in business, but she told me. You wouldn't believe people showing up late for work. Coming up with some of the lamest excuses why they can't work or why they can't come in. Wow. You know what? You will work if you want to work. Yeah. Be faithful. Be faithful. Kids, be faithful. Be faithful to God. You got, listen, you got, you got a parent, a mom, and or, and or a dad that is saved and loves God, trying to serve God, and they're trying to train you and teach you. You ought to be so grateful to God for that. Amen. Don't ever take it for granted. I didn't raise up in a Christian home. But I said, now that I'm saved, and by the way, don't use the past as your reason why you can't do it today. You're an overcomer in Jesus Christ. You can do it. You just got to get busy spending more time with God and helping your family out and zeroing in on that. You can do it. You say, I don't know. You don't know what I've been through. I probably don't. But God knows, and the word is the same for you and me. You'll be accountable to God for that. Amen. Raise them right. Don't give up. I've said this in my life when we were raising our kids. I said, man, if it kills me, I'm telling you, I'm going to stay the course. Amen. What's the point? I'd rather die trying than give up. Amen. Give it. Don't give up. Say, man, I've been through some hard times. I'm sure you have. But you can get back in the race. Just get, pick up that baton and keep on going for Jesus. Finish your course. Finish your race. Finish well. Amen? Oh, the valleys. The valleys. Amen? They're there. They're there. They happen. Amen? They're there. I'll just share three things really quick, and we got it done. We got to be done. I got, I got lost. I know. You're saying, man, isn't he done yet? Yeah, okay. I've already mentioned 1 Samuel 17 with David. There's valleys in the Bible. The Valley of Elah. What's the Valley of Elah? That's the War of Strife and division and separation. Are you there? David got a victory in the valley of Elah with the giant. What's another valley? The other one's in, that's in, that was, by the way, 1 Samuel 17, 3. The other one is the valley of Baca. Psalm 84, verses 5 and 6. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, whose heart are the ways of them who are passing through the valley of Baca. Make it a well. 
and the rain also filleth the pools. Baca means a place of weeping. What's that about, Pastor? Not only should God, listen, if you're in a valley of, of division, of strife, and problems, and battles, and war, and whatever it is in your home, your family, your marriage, at work, whatever it is, God will help you in that valley. The second one, this valley of Baca is a place of weeping. It's a situation unknown. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. Just in case I didn't cover it, that's it, okay? You're in the valley of Baca. God will help you there. God will help you there. If you're there, you say, man, I just, you know, sometimes I talk to people, they're crying or weeping. Sometimes I try to understand. Amen. They don't know why I'm, they don't know why they're there. They don't, they don't. You ever been there? You say, why am I, there? that's probably a lot more people. Isn't that right? And then the Valley of Achor, and I'll wrap up with this. I'm not going to go through it all. What an amazing, you know, Bible says, you know, God tells us in Numbers 32, 23, in an unrelated situation to Joshua 7, he says, be sure your sin will find you out. See, we, we, you know, well, nobody sees me. You're not looking up. But the Valley of Achor is about uh, time of Joshua. God says, hey, listen, don't, don't take there are certain things reserved for the treasury of the house of God. In that battle with Jericho, the spoils were supposed to go to the house of God. There was a guy named, uh, um, my brain here, uh, Nate, what, Achan, that's right, Achan. Achan, and what did he do? He had a wedge of gold. He had a Babylonian garment. He took it, he hid it, and he brought it in his tent. He put it under the tent. Come on, why are you hiding it? Because you know you aren't supposed to have it. That's why people hide things from their spouse or from other people, Christians, because you know it's not right and you know that those people, you know it's wrong. You're just hiding it. Can you imagine? Here's a Babylonian garment underneath and you would be spotted. I mean, listen, everybody would see you're wearing a garment that is unique to the Babylonian peoples. You can't even wear it. I can just see him in the tent. He's looking. No one's around. He's in the tent. No one sees. He lifts it up and looks at it. Oh, oh, maybe he's trying it on. Oh, I like this garment. Oh, someone's coming. Well, so quickly, turn put him back on the tent. Hey, how you doing there, Aiken? Oh, I'm, I'm okay. And I could just see him, you know. You got to read Joshua 7. It's unreal. And then he's got that wedge of uh, silver in there in his tent, you know. And uh, he takes it out and looks around when nobody's around. Oh, oh look at that. The Bible tells us that in, when you read Joshua chapter 7, the verse first, it says, Israel has sinned. You know one person's sin affects the rest? We don't understand that. Well, it's just their sin. Your sin affects somebody. It does. You better get your heart right. So what happens? Through a process of events, he got discovered. There was a great price. He lost his whole family over that. Was it really worth it? You know, I've been, I've been dealing with some people and interacting with some people that are hooked on drugs. Amen. You know, I've never been there. I've never sat where they sat. And many of them have lost everything. Their job, their family, their marriages, everything. But yet they're still hooked on it. Because you know what? They need God. They need the Lord. Amen. You know what? There's some great losses at stake. Hey, listen, guys, I'll throw this out. Pornography on the Internet? Are you ready? You want to lose everything? Oh, it's just pictures, Pastor. Read what Jesus said. You look on a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. Well, I never committed the physical act. God, Jesus says you're an adulterer in your heart. Ooh, that's pretty rough stuff. You love your wife, stay in love with her. Amen. I'll tell you, young people, your parents have rules for devices. You better thank God for that. You don't get free reign on the Internet. You ought to thank God for that. I'm telling you something. You go to the wrong place on the internet, there, as much as there is good on there, there is garbage and trash. I'll tell you something. My kids, of course, we didn't have the internet at first. And then we did get it, but it was lim very limited. 
But we didn't have all these devices. It's like everybody's got, they're con everybody's connected to the internet. How about being connected to God? You say, well, what about Achan? And there's a valley called Valley of Achor. And you know what? If there's some sin you're involved in, you're in this valley. But over in Hosea, it uses this phrase. It says, the valley of Achor, a door of hope. You know what the hope is? That you would get it right before it's too late. Take care of business with God before it's too late. If you're down in that valley in sin, doing stuff you shouldn't be doing, you better take care of business with God. It's a door of hope. It's a place where sin is confessed and judged and put away. I don't know what valley you're in, but whatever it is, God's got you covered. He's the same God, and he'll help you through it. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. We'll close.